Let's go to Texas, specifically Texas A&M. Now, I want to take you back to last year. I saw A&M in person several times from field level last year. I saw him at Clemson, which was about 115 degrees. I think that was like week two or week three. I saw him later in the year at home against Alabama. I saw him even later in the year in a very ugly day in multiple ways, but I'm speaking specifically meteorologically. It was just a, a sloppy day in Athens when they played Georgia. And it, it just struck me last year. I talked about this during the season last year, how hard it seemed for them to move the ball. Just offensively, everything that went right for them, every first down, it felt like a struggle. And you watched some of the better offenses and more prolific offenses in the SEC in the country, and it just seemed like every now and then, you know, a couple times per drive, per, per successful drive, they're just an easy first down. I mean, there, there's just an easy 10 or 15 yards to pick up. I know it's not easy, but they make it look easy. A&M doesn't have that. Texas A&M in the big games, they didn't have that. So I go on vacation, and I see that Bud Elliott put out something that is it's pretty glaring, to be honest with you. So let's frame this the right way. Because I remember last year standing on the field against Clemson or against Alabama or against Georgia, and you looked at the end of the game, and the margins, aside from the Bama game maybe, the margins weren't terrible. They weren't being defeated by four touchdowns. So if you just look at the box scores or you look at the final scores, it doesn't scream A&M got the floor wiped with them. It, that's not what it screams. But yet when you're watching in real time, you're saying, doesn't really feel like they have a good shot to win this. So I remember thinking that at the time. So there's optimism in 2020. A lot of optimism. Some people even going as far as to say, that team, hey, lean in close. Let me whisper. Dark horse. Yeah, dark horse in the SEC West. From what I can tell, most of it has to do with return, returning a quarterback in Kellen Mond in a year where there aren't a ton of returning quarterbacks in the SEC. More on that in a second. Uh, you got Kellen Mond back, but really what I think it comes down to is you guys got done wrong with your schedule last year. It was already hard enough. Not only do they play in the SEC West and they had to cross division their way over to Georgia, they also picked up Clemson in the non-conference rotation. So it was tough, borderline impossible to navigate that last year, winning nine games or more. And they didn't. They were not a bad team last year, but they were a far cry from the elite team. So the optimism this year has a lot to do, to be quite frank with you, with schedule. Whereas last year, you talked about them having one of the toughest this year. It's not the easiest one in the country, but they do drop Clemson. They do drop Georgia from the cross division. And you look at it right now and you ask yourself, who do I think would be ranked top 20? There's only one team that I feel comfortable saying they'll face before the last two weeks of the season, which we'll get to in a second, that would be ranked top 20. And that's Auburn. And I think that's the second or third week of October. They go to Auburn. They got a back-to-back -back road stretch of at Auburn, at South Carolina. Not easy, but I think schedule has a lot to do with this. And you're just another year into Jimbo Fisher. So there's a lot of optimism. I'm not here to rain on that optimism. I call them, and have called them, the most interesting team for me in college football this year for that reason. The potential is there. I mean, the investment's there. The passion's there. Everything's there. We've talked about this before with A&M. Everything's there to win. But there are major question marks here, major offensive question marks. Before you talk about defense and you talk about all that, I'm talking about the specialty of the man who runs this program, and that's Jimbo Fisher, offense. And there are major question marks there. So now I want to get into this. I saw you guys, some of you kind of jumped on old Bud Elliott. And listen, he doesn't need any help fighting for himself and defending himself. But I texted him today and said I was going to defend him a little bit anyway. So he put out a piece a couple of days ago. This has gotten a lot of traction. A lot of you claimed that it was a hit piece. I don't know how with this much data in it and this, this few opinions in it. And then a lot of you asked, oh, is this a troll job? I don't really think so. Not everything that invites you to click on it is a troll job, guys. So with that in mind. Talking about A&M last year, this is Bud Elliott talking now. Looking at games against Clemson, Alabama, Auburn, Georgia, and LSU reveal a troubling pattern. Texas A&M is an offense that relies on the short pass to move football and control the game. It's designed to have an answer to any defense. However, it also does not create a lot of free runners or wide open receivers. Thus, to create explosive plays, reads must be made quickly, passes complete, and in stride. If they're not, it leads to a lack of explosiveness, which was an issue throughout 2019. Now, this is no shocking revelation. This is something that any Texas A&M Aggie fan I talked to last year recognized readily. Jimbo Fisher recognized this. But now we move forward because we're asking, how much has changed? Like, why all this optimism in 2020? Bud continues. 
The elite defenses did not fear explosive passes from the Aggies. They were able to squat on short throws. Okay, again, now we move into the second point here. When you talk about closing that gap, everyone wants to know, have we closed the gap? Well, we're another year in. We got experience at quarterback. Schedule turns our way. When I mentioned those last two games of the year, they are at Alabama, home versus LSU. Those are AM's last two games of the year. So now let's talk about the stark difference between meaningful time and garbage time last year. First off, the Clemson game. AM, 129 yards on 43 plays. That's three yards per play. But once Clemson started to allow short passes and protecting its lead, AM, 160 yards on 26 plays. So garbage time, they run up a 6.2 yards per play average. It continues against Auburn. Auburn jumps out to a 21-3 lead. Then a and in that point, racks up 156 yards on 42 plays. That's good for 3.7 a pop. Then they scored 17 points over their final three drives. 235 yards on 28 plays. That's 8.4 per click. Again, not necessarily garbage time because the game was competitive, but the dynamics of the game had changed. We continue against Alabama, a game I was at. Alabama's up 47-20. They call off the dogs a little bit. Up to that point, A&N, 279 yards on 56 plays. That's five yards per. And after that, 110 yards on 14 plays, about eight yards per. Against Georgia, this one was ugly for both teams offensively. Georgia builds a 19-6 lead. A&M, 46 plays, 152 yards, 3.3 yards per play. After Georgia backs off a little bit, A&M, 122 yards, 16 plays. Seven yards per play. So what are we saying here? What are we because this this kind of happens to a lot of teams. But what are we saying here? Because it continues against LSU. Uh, AM 26 26 plays for 24 yards until LSU gets a 31-nothing lead. And then after that, you get the drill here. I don't need to continue reading off numbers to you. But what are we saying here? So I looked at your reactions. Some of you thought, hey, he's making some good points. Others said, well, you know, this is kind of a hit job, or this is just being critical of mine. And listen, you got to bring counterpoints, database, logic-based counterpoints, because the best I could tell, this, this in, a, in an analytical sort of way, backed up what anecdotally my eyes saw all last year and what makes this team the most interesting in the country this year because they've got a good enough roster. Obviously, they've, they've got, we think, the right coach. They've got experience at quarterback. My question has not been so much personnel issue with them. It's, is what Jimbo Fisher does from a, from a, from a systematic standpoint, is what he does best fit and most tailored to run a major program? They can out-athlete some folks. They can bring in athletes to make plays there. It doesn't necessarily have to be an NFL approach of every, every yard, every inch we gain, we have to scheme guys open. It's kind of what it felt like at times last year. So then I ask what changes are made, and then we continue. I, a lot of you, when I was presenting, I, I know a few AM folks, so I always I presented this to them. I always present you know, the points that I'm going to make on the show to my buddies just to get a general gauge of a reaction I'm going to get. And a lot of them said, well, oh, I think a better run game this year will help us a lot with play action and you know, attracting more attention to the backfield. And that makes sense. So then I'm reading the rest of Elliot's piece here, and there it is. One key might be a better run game, could make play action more effective, but AM already had a very effective run game, rating ninth in the S&P Plus rushing offense last year? The answer is the passing game. He's dead on the money accurate. The answer is not just the passing game, but in particular, explosive plays and making someone see balance offensively truly is not statistical. Balance is making someone believe that you're capable of running it or throwing it effectively on any down. And to maximize that effectiveness, they got to believe that you're capable of stretching the field vertically against them. No one in their right mind believed that against AM last year. So why are they the most interesting? Well, this year, we fast forward, and you could be 10-0. For all AM fans care, you could be 10-0 going into those last two weeks. If they find out, if you go into Alabama and you get drug 47-21, and then you get drug 45-17 to against LSU, they, I know good and well what they'll say. You'll have a 10-win season on your hands, and you'll say, but really, what changed? All that changed is our schedule was more workable because really the product on the field is comparable to what we saw last year. And I can't hypothetically just play out the season, but if that were to happen and that's the end result, I don't know that I'd blame you. But here's what also could happen. What also could happen, a lot of people believe in momentum to varying degrees. Of course, it exists. How important it is week to week, we can determine and debate later. But 
what happens if, unlike last year, when you had a rocky start to the season, all of a sudden, you do build a little more confidence, a little momentum, and most importantly, you find the pieces of your offense and the facets of that offense that need to gel, and they do gel, and the product that you're able to bring into Tuscaloosa in week 11 or 12 or whatever it is, and, and then home against LSU the next week, maybe it does look a far cry different. Maybe Jimbo Fisher does a healthy inventory of his offense in the offseason, and he says, you know, we got a roster good enough. I mean, we may, we, we may not go receiver for receiver with LSU or Alabama, but we're good enough. Our O-line, our running back talent, it's been good enough. At quarterback, we're good enough. I have to take it upon myself to make some adjustments here. Because the bottom line, you know, last year, for instance, or, or this year maybe even, you may look at A&M's offensive line and say, well, they didn't give Kellen Mond really much of a chance. Well, listen. I'm not debating that, but if you saw that and I saw that, guess who else needs to see that? Now, the feeling I got last year at times is Jimbo Fisher, I know he's got a play sheet in his hand, but figuratively, it felt like that, that Clemson game, most notably, it just felt like he kind of throw the hands up, like, what else can I do? There, there is no extra sheet on this play card I have. There is no extra chapter in the playbook. If I'm speaking for him, felt like at times last year he thought, I'm kind of doing everything I could do. I've kind of called everything I could do here. Uh, we're just kind of at an impasse. So maybe that was last year. If there's no adjustment this year, I don't know that I should expect or you should expect this quantum leap, which begs the question, what is the adjustment? And that's about all we can say in June for Texas A&M or really any team thus far.